I was casted up to my shoulder for a fractured wrist back in 2015 for months during my junior year of high school football. And I've been dealing with complications from the restrictions along that limb and even some marked increases in stiffness and achiness, primarily in the wrist and hand. During my time in graduate school, I could tell things were about to get worse with all of the different typing and writing and manual therapy techniques that we needed to be able to perform throughout those two and a half years. So that first fall, I began experimenting with different hand and wrist exercises to seek to alleviate those restrictions that I developed to prevent the dreaded carpal tunnel syndrome. So what's carpal tunnel syndrome? This is a scenario where the median nerve, which runs from the neck to the hand, becomes entrapped somewhere along its path, causing pain and numbness into its innervation in the wrist and hand. Oftentimes, the focus in physical therapy is reducing environmental stressors that could be contributing to these issues. You may have seen ergonomic desks or even computer mouses or keyboards that are designed to reduce flexion at the wrist joint. While those do have a time and a place, it isn't going to solve the root of the issue because according to the research, the main cause of carpal tunnel isn't externally, but internally. The synovium, which is the lining that holds the synovial fluid, becomes fibrotic, which means tight because of adaptations to those environmental stressors. Think of anyone you know that has either had carpal tunnel surgery or complained about numbness or tingling. They probably work some sort of occupation where they have to repetitively flex and extend their hands or do some sort of gripping, typically desk jobs or laborers. These are going to lead to a scenario where the flexor tendons of the hand become adaptively stuck to the band of connective tissue around the median nerve, causing an increase in internal tension. A better mentality is to deal with the internal tension first before resorting to ergonomic aids or relying heavily on pain reducers, medications, or surgery. As I was experimenting with different ways to alleviate my own restrictions, I came across one movement that paralleled common physical therapy interventions for carpal tunnel and that's neural mobilizations. So in my mind, doing hand raises was logistically like the benefits of the tibialis raise. It helped me, but I didn't realize until later on in my graduate school education why it was helpful. It'll help to do a side-by-side -side discussion between the two joints. So at the ankle or the hand, in either of these movements, you are working the muscles on the front of the joint. But what isn't touched on as much is that you're also working a whole slew of nerves in front and behind that become progressively more mobilized during these motions. And any restrictions on the underside of the foot or the hand, whether that be fascia or nerve, they begin to become unglued. The application of this technique is proven to be more beneficial than sham therapy, which leads to positive benefits on nerve biomechanics and regeneration processes while effectively improving pain modulation, nerve conduction velocity, and overall hand function, leading to similar outcomes as those who decide to go under the knife to release that tunnel, which, in my opinion, should only be reserved for those who have exhausted conservative management. And that's comprehensive conservative management, because unfortunately, not all physical therapy is of high quality. The issue of carpal tunnel is that the connective tissue container of the nerve is tight and short and needs to be mobilized. Research shows that mechanical stimulus initiates adaptations ensuring optimal force transmission with muscular contractions. Meaning when you open this, these muscles will then be able to get into those flexed positions without irritating the nerve any longer, changing the mindset away from avoidance and towards resilience. Again, carpal tunnel syndrome has many predisposing factors. But the problem can be explained much like issues at any other joint. If the nourishing component of the hand is restricted, it's going to be very difficult to recover until that restriction is removed. But once you do remove those restrictions, you not only get all of the aforementioned benefits, but you will restore synovial fluid saturation and you also increase the internodal distance in the nerve itself. This increases conduction velocity and improves motor and sensory behavior the tingling numbness issues decrease and your ability to volitionally control the muscles and tendons of the hand and wrist will increase. Now this is just one technique. I'm going to show you what it looks like to pair this technique with the other tried and true principles of the ATG system so you can effectively reverse out carpal tunnel pain from physical therapy to standard. First, we need to get blood flow into the area to prep the tissue for this process. 
With Fit for Function, our physical therapy team utilizes dry needling, cupping, and manual therapy techniques to flood that area with blood flow to prepare for restore and rebuild phases of training. And with ATG, we utilize band flossing and perform wrist rotations to a pain-free muscle burn to desensitize the nervous system, to add resistance internally to the muscles and tissues that aren't able to get effective pain-free motion, and provide a compressive effect that's similar to blood flow restriction therapy to occlude the muscle initially. So after getting a pain-free muscle burn and getting 20 reps, once we remove the band, you'll feel a bolus of blood flood through the area, prepping you for the next step. Making sure you have a band that elicits tension when your wrist is on your leg and in the neutral position. Short range exercises help to flood the area with blood much like flossing does, but allows you to do so with increased resistance externally instead of with the band, you have internal resistance circumferentially. 20 to 50 reps. If you can easily get 50 reps, get more tension on the band. If you can't easily get 20 reps, less tension on the band. Again, we are looking to flood this area with blood to prep for reversing out wrist restrictions with the hand raise. Research also shows that combining neuromobilization with tendon gliding exercises increases the effect of the modality. So manipulating the positions of the fingers will actually increase the effect that this neuromobilization will have with your recovery. So I like to personally use hand spreads, windshield wipers, bear claw, spider pulses, reverse opposition, and then full hand raise. The setup for this position is very simple. Just get some sort of surface that you can reach your arm out to, and you're gonna walk your hand out until you feel some tension on the underneath of the wrist. You wanna make sure it's a position that you could tolerate, breathing pain-free before even adding any motion. The next step of this is to ensure that your elbow is up off the bench. The median nerve runs underside of this area, so if you have it coming down like this, it can sort of get tingly. Shoulder down, elbow up, wrist down. Then perform the series of hand exercises just explained. Again, 20 to 50 reps for this exercise series. If you can easily get 50 reps with one stage, you can move on to the next stage. If you can't get 20 reps in any stage in this series, you regress back down until you can easily get 20 reps. Next, we want to work long range of the wrist flexors. This will help to develop the strength of those tendons that we just opened up with the hand raises, working up to a goal of 10% body weight for 20 to 30 reps. Whatever weight that you decide to use, if you can easily get 30, you are good to increase. And if you cannot easily get 20, it's time to move down in weight. Then a good call when training any area of the body is just targeting the other side for comprehensiveness. True, the radial nerve on the back of the hand can actually cause antagonistic inflammation and alongside its fascia can cause restrictions internally that make flexion harder to perform. So performing the hand raise with a radial nerve focus, walking the hand out but this time with your back supported until your wrist is off of the bench, feeling that tension, elevating the elbow, but now driving the wrist down and in. You should feel some tension on the upper side, on the top of the hand, going into the fingers, making sure to drive your hand down and in with your fingers to get full stretch of that nerve. Again, 20 to 50 reps. If you can easily get 50 reps, the stretch is too easy. Increase it by moving your body away or walking your hand out. And if you can't get 20 reps, regress it back. While also loading the wrist extensors, this one will be a 10% of your body weight for a standard goal of 20 to 30 reps. If you can't easily get 20 reps, go down in weight. And if 30 reps is too easy, go up. So my philosophy is to rehabilitate from a local to a global approach. This is the local approach, but we need to understand the anatomy of that median nerve for the other places that it can become entrapped. Research shows that other entrapment sites include the pronator teres, biceps brachii, pec minor, and scaling muscles. So I'm going to show you different ways to approach these restrictions from rehab to resilience. We can eccentrically load the pronator teres muscles with this movement, going for 10% body weight for 20 to 30 reps. If you can easily get 30 reps, go up in weight. And if you can't get 20 reps, go down in weight. For the entrapment site of the biceps brachii, we can easily access when we're in prone, walking the arm out, 
until we get a stretch in the underside of that limb, pinning the wrist down, elbows up. Instead of raising up from the hand, we're gonna pin the other arm down and rotate towards that side. Thinking of driving the torso away from the shoulder, which will stretch the biceps from its attachment site. Again, 20 to 50 reps. If you can easily get 50 reps, increase the stretch. If it's too much for you, regress the stretch. Once we finally do get access in that biceps, we can then get some eccentric load with the dumbbell inclined hammer curl, going for 12 reps towards a 20% body weight standard. Thinking of letting gravity take my arm down, keeping my elbow back, and letting that arm get fully extended and actually slightly pronated before coming back up. What's key in this movement is to not let the elbow come up too fast because that'll take load off of the biceps. Chilling down. Nice loading up. Again, if you're finding this too easy for 12 reps, then go up in weight. And if you're finding it too hard for 12 reps, go down in weight. Another biceps exercise after the dumbbell hammer curl to progress to would be the Scott curl. And this just allows for greater emphasis at the elbow joint specifically. So what we're gonna do is get whatever weight that we can tolerate for 10 reps. And we're gonna position onto the bench, our armpit on the lip of the bench and keeping our off hand on the top of our shoulder just for stabilization. We're gonna try to fight to fall down, sort of like a Nordic, but for the elbow, keeping the emphasis on that elbow, we're trying to get lengthening of these tissues where the median nerve comes out of and then strengthen on the way up. Controlling down, one, two, three, pausing and exploding up. The goal for this is to get towards 15% of your body weight for 10 reps. If the weight is too easy at any point, go ahead and go up in weight. And if the weight is too hard, make sure you regress towards your pain-free limit. The other entrapment site was noted to be the pec minor, and this is one that we can access with the overhead pec stretch. So what we're gonna do is reach to some overhead surface that's stable. You're gonna drop the leg back that's on the working arm and gripping into the surface, shooting the shoulder down and rotating away, thinking of breathing in, breathing out, and rotating down and towards the front leg, getting access into the often locked short pec minor muscle. And then we can eccentrically load with two other exercises, the incline dumbbell press and the full range push-up. With the incline dumbbell press, we're gonna go for a weight that you can comfortably maintain an eight rep max, going for elbows below sternum, full control at the top with full extension and fighting the fall down. One, two, three, holding and exploding up. If you can't maintain that tempo, then it's too much weight. And if it's too easy to maintain that tempo, then go up and wait. For the full range push-up, the form is similar. We wanna to get to a shoulder length and width that we can allow our torso to come completely down to the extent that when I reach the bottom position, my elbows are above my torso. I'm feeling a stretch in that pack insertion. And with control, I'm pressing up, full extension, and fighting down one, two, three, and holding. If I can't maintain that tempo and can't maintain that control, it's too much effort, in which case you can just start from a higher surface to regress. <sighs> Finally, we have the scaling muscles. These are muscles that are deep to the neck, onto the sides. You can gain access into these areas with simple lateral neck stretching, working towards five breaths in the bottom position, <sighs> letting the neck elongate while the diaphragm pulls the torso down. Repeating between sides, then progressing towards progressive overload to the neck in both flexion and side flexion. So what this would look like is getting positioned on a bench. I prefer having a 45 degree angle, especially for the neck flexion position, making sure you have both hands on it. I'm going to just use one hand because it's funny because I like to hold my laptop while I do stuff, even though I'm not even looking at it. And maintain that neutral position at the top and fight gravity in the weight that seeks to pull you down. Thinking of pressing up through my forehead, and maintaining that top position. The goal on this one is to try to work towards 10% of body weight for 10 reps long term. If you can't easily get 10 reps for whatever weight you're doing, please just go down and wait. And if you easily get 10 reps, then you can go up and wait. For the side of the neck, just repeat the same exercise progression, but making sure the bench is flat 
So going ahead and getting my weight in my laptop because it's funny. You're going to go ahead placing the weight on the top of your head, keeping the bottom arm comfortable, lowering down to full stretch and lateral neck flexion, and then coming up back to neutral. Again, if you can easily get 10 reps for whatever weight you're working on, then go ahead and go up in weight. If you cannot easily get 10 reps, then go down in weight. So to summarize, the exact protocol I would use for reversing out carpal tunnel from physical therapy to ATG standard would be stage one of dry needling, cupping, and manual therapy to get into the following stages pain-free. A local focus of the hand and wrist, one to three sets of band flossing for recovery, at a pain-free muscle burn, then 20 more reps. One to three sets of short range wrist flexion at 20 to 50 reps. One to three sets of hand raises at 20 to 50 reps, progressing from hand spreads, bear claw, spider pulse, reverse opposition, and full hand raise. One to three sets of long range wrist flexors towards 10% body weight, 20 to 30 reps. One to three sets of hand raise, radial nerve focus, 20 to 50 reps. One to three sets of long range wrist extension towards 5% body weight, 20 to 30 reps. Then stage three, global focus at the elbow, one to three sets of loaded supination for the pronator teres at 20 to 30 reps working towards 10% body weight. One to three sets of prone one arm hand raise for biceps break a stretch for 20 to 50 reps. One to three sets of dumbbell incline hammer curl for a 12 rep max working towards 15% body weight. One to three sets of the squat curl for 10 reps working towards 15% body weight. Then at the shoulder, one to three sets of 10 to 20 breaths for the overhead pec minor stretch. One to three sets of incline dumbbell press working towards 40% body weight per hand for eight reps, one to three sets of full range push up working towards 20 reps pain free, and finally at the neck, one to three sets of lateral neck stretching at five to 10 breaths, one to three sets of neck flexion working towards 10% body weight for 10 reps, one to three sets of lateral neck flexion working towards 10% body weight for 10 reps. Then what I would do in a typical week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, I would work stage two of the hand and wrist, Tuesday, I would work stage three of the elbow, Wednesday, I would work stage four of the shoulder, Thursday, stage five of the neck, and Friday, again, going back to the hand and the wrist, and rest Sunday and Saturday. And after one week of getting acclimated to this protocol, I would then add in the hand raise progression as a daily warm up before every workout of the day, as this is the most direct stage to reversing out those restrictions in the carpal tunnel, and specifically that synovium that nourishes the nerve and tendons of the hand. If you have any questions on how to implement this, please shoot me a DM, and I'd love to troubleshoot.